Hello, hello, fine people of the interwebs. I am live right now, um, adjusting my camera, adjusting. Uh, so a little uh, thing for you all watching this live video. Hi, Rosemary. That's my boyfriend's mom. Um, <laughs> I have a wonderful quote behind me, but we're doing a Facebook Live tonight, which we will rip the audio and video for the podcast. Uh, but there is a quote behind me. Now, it is backwards on Facebook. And so if you can read that, that means you have super woke intellectual abilities. Hi. Hello, lovely people. So I have a really awesome guest tonight, but while I am waiting for him to request join, um, I'm going to just plug a few things that I'm doing right now. Obviously, this is airing live on Facebook, but it's going to go to um, some other platforms, which I'm really excited about. Um, I have joined uh, one of the coolest podcast networks out there. One of the top five libertarian podcast networks. And, oh, there's Murray. I'm going to add Murray real quick because he's my guest. I'm approving you, Murray. So I am, uh, I have a show on the We Are Libertarians podcast network, which is fairly new. Um, and it's an awesome network. It's called Ginger Archie. Hi, Murray. You can adjust all you need to. This is very informal. Um, so you can follow me at Ginger Arkey, uh, Facebook, Trisha, Trisha Stewart, Facebook, Instagram, Trisha.Stewart, uh, Twitter, Trisha Arkey. So it's T-R-I-C-A-R-C-H-Y. Um, can you find me all, on all those social media accounts? But if, hi, Murray, you're a little, uh, the video is a little corrupted. Okay, that's better. Um, and so the video will show up on uh, We Are Libertarians Network. Um, it's a cool podcast network, and I want to give a shout out to a lot of the cool shows there. I am their token anarchist and their token ginger, so I am not quite half as fancy as the people on that show. But you should definitely go there um, if you're looking for a podcast to follow or some new information. They're definitely uh, somebody that you want to follow. So go to We Are Libertarians podcast network or We Are Libertarians dot com or go on Facebook. You can just type it in and you'll find it. Hello, Dr. Murray Sabrin. Am I saying it correctly? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I am Absolutely. so glad that you have joined me this evening. Thank you and welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, the first interview since my book was published. The, uh, That's and posted awesome. On Facebook, We're going to get uh, to your book Amazon the other day. probably uh, the, the largest part of our discussion. But first... I would like to let people know who my guest is and I am certainly outclassed by him. Um, and I'm really excited to have him on. This is Dr. Murray Sabrin. He hails from New Jersey. Can you say Jersey in a Jersey accent? Joysy. Yes. Very nice. Um, Joysy. So I would describe <laughs> you as a professor, um, an activist, a historian, an economist, and one of the most badass or, original gangster libertarians that there are around. Would you agree with that? I did. Oh, wonderful. Well, like I, I think said, you, you nailed I do it. an informal show. I do social media and um, I am not a historian. I'm an activist though. So we have that. We can cross over there. Uh, we're going to promote your new book. What is the title of your new book? Why the Federal Reserve Sucks. It Causes Inflation, Recessions, Bubbles, and Enriches the 1%. And I, there should be another yeah. subtitle, which oh, I didn't well, put in we'll there. What that. we can then do I'm about it. I'm adding that onto the show uh, outline for sure. So, Murray, something um, I like to do is I like to get personal. So I love liberty. Um, I'm a fan of praxology, human action. But I like to get to know the people behind liberty. So... Something I find is interesting. You were born in Germany and your parents were Holocaust survivors. Um, so Murray was born in 1949. Am I correct? No, that's when we came to America. Next month Holy is cow. my 70th okay. anniversary so how of coming old to were America. You when you came here, what's your liberty story? Just give us a background on that. I was two and a half years old. My parents were the only ones in their family to survive uh, World War II. My father, there's a picture of him and right in front of me. Uh, some of it is in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. He led 240 partisans. He was a commander in Poland. And uh, for a year, he was fighting the Nazis till they were liberated by the Russians in July 1944. 
and um, my mother and he and uh, my older brother, who was born during the war, uh, we came to America. First of all, my mother and father and young older brother came to uh, West Germany in 1946 when my mother was pregnant with me. And we stayed there for two and a half years and we came to America because my father's uh, great aunt lived in America who raised his mother in America. And then she went back to Poland. And my father's first cousin came to America, I think in 1946, 47. So they sponsored us to, to America. That's why I'm a firm believer if people want to come to America, do what we did, get sponsors so you're not a burden on the American people. And I think that would solve a lot of the immigration problems that we're facing today instead of having hordes of people coming across the border. I think if we have an orderly procession of people who are sponsored like we were, and there's an organization called HIAS um, that has uh, been around for 150 years helping refugees all over the world. They helped us, according to my uh, father's uh, story when uh, I was old enough to ask, how did we get to America? And so learning as a youngster what they had to go through to survive World War II, and as I became a history major as an undergraduate and started learning about finance and economics at, and, and libertarianism in the late 60s, early 70s, I said, uh, not only is big government evil when it goes to its extreme, but what we have today, the welfare warfare state, is um, is bad because it takes people's money away through taxation. It regulates them through the regulatory state. It, we have undeclared wars mm -hmm. um, since the end of World War II, which are not obviously in our interest. And so we have this welfare warfare state, the term that Murray Rothbard um, uh, coined, that I think just sums up the problem we're facing in America. Now, that's the bad side. The good side is, and this is something as a finance professor, I've, I've really appreciated over the last 34 years teaching finance. American entrepreneurs are incredibly productive, creative, innovative, and that's why our standard of living is as high as it is, and we're not Venezuela, or we're not Greece, or we're not some of the other Western countries that uh, have had big governments. So we have enough free enterprise in America so we can enjoy the fruits of all the great innovations mm -hmm. that have taken place, such as the phone that I'm speaking to you on, the yeah. iPhone, which is an incredible invention when mm -hmm. you think about it. We can call people around the world for free. When years ago, that would cost an arm and a leg and only rich people and, and corporations would do that. But now we can video chat anywhere in the world, which is an amazing phenomenon. And we have more computing power than the computers that 50 years ago sent the men to the moon. So I believe that we are in a glass half full and half empty. The half full is all the great productivity and entrepreneurship that's in America. The half empty is this incredible size of the welfare warfare state that is really undermining our prosperity and our freedoms. And that's why I've dedicated myself to writing about this. That's why I wrote this book on the Fed. I'm currently writing a book on health care, which is going to be a big issue in the political, uh, in the presidential campaign next year. And then next year, I want to write a book on a, uh, <laughs> on war and peace, but uh, that title has no. already been taken. So I have to, <laughs> to come up, have to come up with another title. Mm -hmm. No, th th this is important because uh, there are still people in Washington who think that we have to rule the world. And this is, I think, one of the Achilles heel, Achilles heel of the country is that there are people who believe that uh, it's our destiny, just as we um, settle the West, we have to now make sure we have world order through uh, American mm -hmm. troops all over the world. We have troops in 900 countries. We have uh, bases yeah, all over the world. We're we have uh, money is going all over the world. Right we're spending. Yeah. It's it's amazing. When we were in Australia several years ago, um, and driving on the tour bus, the uh, the tour guide said, "Look over in the distance. You see that building there? That's an Amer secret American outpost." So they have listening. Po uh, our government has listening posts all over the world, as if somebody's ready to invade us. I mean, no one can invade us. No. No one has invaded us. And so this whole notion that uh, we have to have a military that's bigger than the mm -hmm. 10 next uh, military uh, in the world is just uh, outlandish that was, World War II is supposed to give us peace forever. And it certainly hasn't happened that way. Uh, that was the war to end uh, uh, Nazism and uh, Japanese aggression. And what we've done is uh, built up this huge military industrial mm -hmm. complex that President Eisenhower warned about in his 61 
very well addressed. So I believe that um, liberty is the natural mm -hmm. is the natural right, if you will, of human beings. It's the way we have international peace, we have commerce, we have social mm -hmm. justice, yes. if you will, to use a term that, that has been appropriated. Uh, because individual rights is, is, as the Declaration says, is guaranteed to us by, by our Creator. If you believe that, if not, uh, mm -hmm. it's basically the way to have a civilized society. And of course, it's described in the Bill of Rights. It's the Bill of Rights, rights that we have as individual citizens that the government is supposed to protect. Unfortunately, the government has trampled on all our rights uh, from the First Amendment to the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. And so that's what's upset, mm -hmm. upsets oh, people around the country. That's why Trump won, by the way. He tapped into the, he tapped into the angst of, of people in the, uh, in the so-called flyover country who were felt this, this engaged from the government. And the government has been telling them how to live their lives and uh, doing trade deals, which has not been in their best interest. And essentially uh, hollowing out the American economy. And so we're dependent upon nations around the world for basic um, manufactured goods Good. when a lot of them could be produced. I'm not a protectionist by any means. All I'm saying is our, our monetary policy has created so many dollars. Those dollars have gone overseas. That's mm -hmm. built up the economies of China and South Korea and other countries. Hmm. And so basically our biggest export has been dollars, not goods that, um, that would give us a trade surplus. Not that I a trade surplus is, is that important. Um, so, uh, but, go ahead. Uh, Obviously, I believe that you are a minarchist. You believe in some legitimate form of government. Is that true? Well, so so little that uh, it wouldn't matter who's the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. They could go and do cut, uh, ribbon cuttings. Uh, the same thing with governors and um, and mayors. Uh, the point is, uh, theoretically, I think we could mm -hmm. have a society without a formal government, just as uh, Bruce Benson pointed out in his great book, I think it's called the, um, um, some, where he pointed out that uh, throughout history, uh, we've had oh. society and law, not, the enterprise of law, that's what it's called. Bruce Benson, the economist, the enterprise of law. It's a phenomenal book. It, I think it was published in the early nineties. He pointed out that there have been societies mm -hmm. where you haven't had formal governments, but you've had law because people, in their culture accepted the tribal elders or the, the wise people of society that would issue uh, uh, laws or rules or guidelines that people accepted mm -hmm. because it was in everyone's self-interest to have a peaceful society. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very expensive to be a crook <laughs> because not only do you need armaments, mm -hmm. but you may get killed in, uh, very quickly. So the, the point is, he points out in Enterprise of Law, there have been societies throughout Europe, throughout South America, throughout Asia, that you haven't had formal governments. So uh, I think we came very, very close to that in the colonial period, governments were very small. And even when uh, the Republic was formed, uh, we didn't have much of a government, a central government, Ugh. except that Screw Hamilton that was pushing for that early <laughs> on in our history. Ugh. And uh, yeah, I mean, Hamilton I is one agree. of the, yeah. he should be taken off the $10 yeah. bill and Harriet Tubman put on there. I mean, he is, he is the, as the, uh, Tom oh, DeLorenzo truly, pointed out, I think that's the father of crony I had not capitalism. heard that before. So um, I'm already going off of my outline, which I told you I'm an informal host. I'm not a fancy pants. But you tied uh, the dollar to um, world currency and being unsafe because of uh, how the dollar doesn't really hold any true yeah. value. And I think that's a really cool way to tie the dollar to war. Could you expound on that a little bit? Well, yeah, I mean, you really have to go back to World War I. World War I, I think, was one of those important events in human history because if you look at World War I, all the countries went off the gold standard so they could print up money to pay for the war. And then when we went back to the gold standard, uh, Britain messed it up badly, and their economy was sort of depressed throughout the 1920s, and our Federal Reserve helped bail them out by printing up dollars, which gave us the real estate mm -hmm. and uh, stock market boom, and we know how that ended. It ended in the crash, the Great mm -hmm. Depression, and then the trade wars of the 1930s. So World War I was a defining moment. Uh, Germany had hyperinflation after World War I. Uh, Russia had hyperinflation. A lot of countries had hyperinflation. So they understood mm -hmm. that printing up money will lead to disasters. And so war and printing money go hand in hand. You cannot have big government and war without 
the printing mm-hmm. press. And that's what governments do quite well. They print up a lot of money and destroy the currency. Now, our currency has been in a slow freefall for 100 years since the Federal Reserve was created. Uh, but now we're seeing the end of this experiment, the Bretton Woods system. By the way, this month is the 75th anniversary of the Bretton Woods system that gave us the post-war monetary system that Nixon uh, helped uh, close down in 1971 when he severed Let the last link you, of and dollar because, and gold um, in 1971. I have anything intellectual to say, but because I would say that, uh, so a lot of my followers on Facebook might not be anarchists or libertarians, and so they probably have no background in what you're talking about. Can you give a little overview of the Federal Reserve, how it came to being, and then where we are now? Sure. Yeah, th- th- this is a fascinating history. So if you're a history major, American history major, an economic historian, a financial historian, the the creation of the Federal Reserve is essentially the dream of Hamilton going back 100 years earlier. And those folks who wanted central banking, they attempted three three times to have a central bank in the United States, and they all failed. And then we Mm -hmm. had a panic of 1907, the one that J.P. Morgan bailed out the federal government. That Uh, led to a secret meeting in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Because uh, that, I don't think most uh, people, and I, and I apologize for interrupting, but um, yeah. I know that people are probably as not as well educated as you on here. And so Jekyll Islands has been a bit of a yeah. conspiracy theory for a while, but it's actually open source information. So yeah. tell people a little bit more in depth about that. Absolutely. Well, what happened is representatives of the Morgan banking interest, the Rockefellers, uh, Kuhn Loeb, the big Wall Street banks, some people from uh, Congress, Senator Aldrich from Rhode Island, uh, who was married to uh, one of the Rockefellers. And uh, they got together and basically ironed out the blueprint for the Federal Reserve. And there's a great video uh, from the Mises Institute by Professor Rothbard, who uh, talks about the founding of the Federal Reserve. It's an hour long. I urge everyone to uh, uh, view it. I show it in my financial history class, the founding of the Federal Reserve. It was the last piece of the progressive period which cartelized the most important sector of the economy, banking, because the bankers operate under a very flawed system. It's called fractional reserves, where they borrow short and lend long. If everyone, mm-hmm. anyone saw the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where there's a bank run at the end of the movie. People are trying to get their money out of the Bailey savings and loans. This is an example of, of the flawed system. So the bankers realized they could not continue to have fractional reserve banking unless they had a lender of last resort, that's what's one of the reasons for the Federal Reserve being created, to have an institution that would uh, buy the assets of banks and provide them with liquidity if they ran into trouble. So so in 1910, they got together, and you can read this on the Federal Reserve's website of the creation of the Federal Reserve, and they got together, and they had to sell this to the American people as an anti-bank bill, but it was really a pro-banking bill because the bankers needed a federal government backstop to prevent more bank runs because throughout the 19th century, we had banking panics. The Panic of 1819, which was written by Professor Rothbard, that was his doctoral dissertation in the 1950s, explaining how the money printing uh, from the War of 1812 onward led to the pa- banking panic of 1819. Then we had the mm-hmm. Panic of 1837, 1850. It goes on and on and on. In other words, the banks are terribly flawed institutions And eventually we got a central bank. We were the last major industrialized nation to get a central bank. Uh, The first central bank was the Bank of England in the the 1690s. And so we got the central bank that was basically the uh, the heaven sent for the bankers because now they could have an institution that would back them up if things went wrong. We saw what happened during the financial crisis of 2008. The Federal Reserve stepped in and bought up trillions of dollars of assets to prop up Wall Street and the banking sector. So we got the Federal Reserve in 1913. It started operating in 1914, and it started printing money when uh, World War I began, and we entered the war in 1917. And uh, that gave us a correction after the war, the, what's called the Forgotten Depression, a book titled by Jim Grant, who's a longtime uh, financial analyst, uh, writes for, still writes for Barron's again, who pointed out that we had a very deep depression after World War I, It was a correction for all the money printing that we took place, just like we've had the last 10 years. And uh, then we had the Roaring Twenties. But we had the Roaring Twenties because of great productivity, a lot of innovation in the 1920s, but we also had a lot of money printing, which Mm -hmm. gave us this huge stock market bubble that ended in October 1929. 
And then Hoover was president, and he did everything wrong, intervening, trying to prop up prices as the banks were collapsing and money was being um, uh, credit was being liquidated, so the money supply was falling, and so prices had to fall also. So instead of prices falling and wages falling. We got 25 percent unemployment by 1932, and he was utterly Mm -hmm. defeated at the uh, polls in 1932 by FDR, who ran on a very fiscal conservative platform. Very ironic, right? He said we've got to restore the gold standard. (laughs) We've got to have a balanced budget. It it is well. This this is why when you learn this, you realize every president, every candidate that wins the presidency goes back typically on what they campaigned on. Uh, Johnson in '64, no boys are going to go to Vietnam. Wilson in 1916, no boys, we're not going to go to Europe to fight the war. And a few months after, a month after he was inaugurated, 1917, we're in World War I. FDR in 1940, when war was raging in Europe, he said, American boys are not going to Europe to fight the wars in Europe. And Johnson in 64 said, American boys are not going to Vietnam. And of course, Bush said, we have to humble foreign policy in 2000 when he ran for president. And of course, three years later, we go, we're, we're right. invading Iraq, a country that was no threat to us at all. And so in order to do all this stuff, the government needs money. So they don't raise taxes to pay for it because that would be an outcry by the public. So they print up money. They literally buy up assets from the banks, usually government securities. And that injects money to the system, which allows the federal government to borrow all this money. And we're off to the races. And so we've seen this over and over again since the Federal Reserve has create, been created, that the printing of money and the welfare welfare yes. state or the welfare warfare state go hand in hand. You cannot have a welfare warfare state unless you have a central bank that's ready to prop up the, uh, the economy and the federal government. And by the way, what, the most insidious thing that the Federal Reserve has done is depress interest mm-hmm. rates so the federal government can, has borrowed. Ten tri- at least ten trillion dollars and, in the and, last ten and years who will be the victim at very of low the interest rates. Not which the government, means that the, the people. Mm-hmm. Well, it's going to be. Well, no, of course not. It's going to be the average mm-hmm. person who may get laid off or lose their house mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be, like we saw in two thousand eight and two thousand nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's Main Street that gets hurt by all this money printing. Uh, now we have a boom, so unemployment looks pretty good now, under four mm-hmm. percent or thereabouts which historically is very low. But I think that that is a number that is, is uh, fallacious because right. a lot of people are no, are no longer looking for work. And well, some people have two, two jobs. Some people have part-time jobs uh, only. Because, you know, if, if somebody's not looking for work anymore, it, they're still unemployed. <laughs> I mean, that's common sense, but yeah. the government has no common sense. So. <laughs> the, well, the, the thing is, I, I don't trust government numbers because uh, – the thing is with the, with the uh, consumer price index, it's been at this mm-hmm. uh, roughly 2% area for several years now. Now, that's very unusual mm-hmm. for an index like that to be flatlined, if you will, for, for many, many years. So uh, one thing I noticed, uh, and they're supposed to take this into account, and we've been told this when we bought appliances a few years ago. Oh, they ago, have. The quality yeah. of the appliances have really come down. So instead of a refrigerator, le- and instead of a ref- refrigerator lasting 15 years or more, they mm-hmm. tell us you're lucky if you get 10 years out of a new refrigerator these days. So you're paying a lot more mm-hmm. money for an item that's giving you a lot less value. And that's supposed to be reflected mm-hmm. in the CPI. I don't think it is. Uh, and the thing is, everything is thrown into the CPI. So I, I want to write an article which, uh, that says that the CPI is, gives us a full sense of what is mm-hmm. happening to prices. Because we know taxes sure. go up every year. Prop, my ta- property taxes go up every year. Uh, uh, we pay more Social Security taxes every year as your salary goes up. Um, Mm -hmm. But we don't buy a house every year. We don't buy a a computer every year. We don't buy a car every year. So what what I'm going to propose is that we have uh, an index that talks about consumer Hmm. capital goods, goods that last a long time, and see how those prices are doing, and then have uh, a separate thing for services, uh, which the government does now, a separate thing for uh, things that food, uh, food and uh, gasoline that we buy on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. So we need to have a consumer. You're working on a book on that right is a now, big item, you? obviously, in a lot of people's budgets. Uh, it, it's amazing what you come up with health care. In fact, what we're seeing today, um, Tricia, is tr- ha- President Truman's vision from 1945 of having a single payer system. He proposed this in 1945. 
And then mm-hmm. President Johnson got the ball rolling with Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. Yeah, the Medicare Act. Then reacts, President yeah. Bush with uh, prescription drugs. And then President Obama. Mm-hmm. And then uh, President Obama with Obamacare. And so the next logical step in this progression from a vision in 1945, which is what, uh, uh, 74 years ago, to single payer system, maybe in oh. 10, 20 years. Oh, it's That's inevitable. where we're headed. That's the road For that sure. we've been traveling on. And so, and the thing, that's why I'm writing this book to point out that there's a really big difference in what we need to do between a government healthcare system, a single payer system, and a free market doctor patient relationship that would make sure that everyone is covered. That's, that's the goal that I have in this book to point out how everyone can get medical care without having big government. Without in fact, even even government involved you, at all. Um, in how do care. you inform people of that? How do you get that out <coughs> to the mass public? Because I don't think that uh, the American people are liberty minded or even understand free markets anymore. There's probably like one uh, percent of us, which are libertarians, that do. Because obviously, Democrats and Republicans have no idea what a free market is or um, even economics, like basic. Regardless of if they're Chicago or Keynesian or, well, I, or <laughs> Austrian. They have no idea. So how do you get that message out there? Well, this is the challenge. That's why I either write a book. Uh, I mean, I wrote an op-ed uh, recently for the local paper. Maybe 200,000 people read it, uh, either online or the hard copy. So, And the editor likes the stuff that I write, even though he's a left-winger. So uh, uh, he says, you write really well. So um, I, that's a compliment from an editor who's, uh, who said that you really write well, and he didn't change anything in, in and he put he puts my letters in quite frequently. Um, <laughs> and so when I write a letter, it's usually the maximum 250 words. So a lot of people see that. Uh, and this is how we get the message out. And so I have a provocative title for my book on the Fed, because, as you know, th- the left has been very successful in getting publicity. Look at the four freshman oh, I see. congresswomen who are getting no, this incredible publicity. You couldn't media. buy the Marie, publicity. Yeah, you can't buy um, the publicity that. Yeah. Well, this is it. If, if we could reach 100,000, 200,000, a half a million people, and we can get the, my book sales to a high ranking on Amazon and possibly get on the New York Times bestseller list, then the media will have to engage me in saying, do we need a Federal Reserve given all the bad things that it does? It creates inflation, recessions, bubbles, and enriches the 1%. So what social good, economic good, is the Federal Reserve? And I have answers for all their uh, objections to, to why we need a Federal Reserve. And so that's what I want to do is go out there and challenge the conventional thinking mm-hmm. on, on money, on credit, on banking, and really show the American people. This is just common sense. I mean, if you had an unlimited checking account, which is what the Federal Reserve does, think about this. It has an unlimited check account. When I first learned about this 50 years ago, I said, my goodness, what are the consequences of that? And then when I started researching my dissertation in the 1970s about inflation, I said the key to the dollar, remember we had double digit inflation in 73, 74, then again in 79. And I said the key to the US dollar remaining the world's reserve currency is the trust that foreigners have in holding dollars and buying our treasuries. Now that may be over in the not too distant future because we are reading reports that both China and Russia Mm -hmm. are buying gold for their central bank if i can interject real that's really reserves scary, instead of the u.s dollar um, in reserve state that the united states is in in around the globe we are um, involved in a lot of proxy wars um and we hold weight and i'm just going to say this in a very mm-hmm. basic general general uh generic term for the people that are following that might not be libertarians or whatever um and so our dollar falling has a lot of repercussions as far as like the countries that might not go to war with us or, or may back us or want our money. Um, the dollar has a lot to do with the war state. And I know we touched on that earlier, but it's a really scary proposition for the dollar to fall. Well, this is it. when the dollar declines, prices go up for foreign goods and that will 
will, will, will filter through the consumer price index and give us higher inflation as measured by the consumer price index. But it looks like inflation is going to accelerate yeah. because of all these trade wars. We're getting less goods coming into the country, and therefore there's less supply of goods. There's a lot of money in the system, and that's I, one I, of I'm the sure uh, definitions of inflation, too much Butler. money chasing too few goods. I, I think it's one of his quotes, and I could be oh, misattributing yeah, it, so I apologize because I'm – as I said, I'm not fancy. But it, it was something about when goods and services do not cross borders, soldiers will – was that? Well, I think uh, I think. Oh, uh, it's Bastiat. It was a Bastiat quote, to, which uh, I love him. Frederick he's like Bastiat. he's like Shakespeare for um, minarchism or anarchism. <laughs> but yeah, it, and it's very true though. His, I've read it several times. His, his book, The Law, has such a profound impact. I first read that in 1974. Um, it was it was part of my libertarian education back in the 1970s, and I picked it up. And to me, it is probably one of the most important books of Western civilization because he was mm -hmm. writing this to oppose the communism and socialism it, of Europe in the mid 19th century. And, and it's it not even, it's very it poetic. I, I love his writing. He, you can tell that he's a, a writer and not necessarily um, a philosopher or a politician. Um, so it, his writing translates to a lot of people because it touches them on the heart. And I would quite agree. Um, I feel bad that I misattributed. I love Smedley Butler, but um, yeah, Bastiat, me say. But um, it, it's very ironic um, because a lot of people disassociate economics and the war state and social justice and government, and they're all so much intertwined if you study human action. They're, they're the same thing. Yep. And so you're an Austrian economic person. You, uh, you're a fan of Mises, Ludwig von Mises. <laughs> but unfortunately, you and I never Danny had the opportunity Rothbard. to meet him. But so Mur you rubbed Rothbard shoulders was a with him. Of my dissertation. Tell us about that because he was a member of my dissertation amazing. committee. So tell yeah, us about yeah, your yeah. experiences with Rothbard. Well, it, it, well, the first exposure I had to Murray Rothbard's writings was thirty-six thousand feet above the um, Atlantic Ocean flying home from Italy in 1971 mm -hmm. after uh, President Nixon imposed wage price controls. And someone was reading the New York Times in early September 1971, and, there was, and I saw the op-ed article, The President's Economic Betrayal. And I asked the gentleman um, who was reading it, I said, can I have it after you're done? And he said, sure. So I read it. And this was the most lucid, clear discussion of President Nixon's wage price controls. Now, I had been familiar mm -hmm. with fr some free market economics, reading Milton Friedman in, in uh, Newsweek magazine and, and um, Alan Greenspan and Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, about the importance of um, having a gold-backed monetary system. But Rothbard really laid it out. I think it's one of the most brilliant essays during that period about um, wage price controls and economic freedom. And then I just sort of put it aside and... Um, when I went to graduate school in the early 70s and I developed a dissertation topic, I uh, invited him to uh, be a member of my dissertation committee, which he said yes. And he got me an invitation to How the first cool Austrian economic feel? conference in South World in Vermont <laughs> in 1974. Oh, that was, that was very special because I was just learning this material. And I uh, roomed with Joe Salerno, uh, the great Austrian economist uh, from Pace University and the Mises Institute. And um, he got his PhD uh, about the same time I did at Rutgers. He was in the economics department. I was in the geography department, but my PhD was on economic geography, studying inflation and how it affects local economies. And um, I just immersed myself in Rothbard's writings, Mises' writings, Hayek's writings, and just really became um, uh, a, not only a fan, but someone who wanted to write in this tradition of, uh, on, on contemporary mm -hmm. issues, applying the principles of human yes. action. Because it's so simple. Everyone wants to achieve their goals, short-term, intermediate, and long-term mm -hmm. goals. And if you do it peacefully, you're a libertarian. Oh, <laughs> if you don't do I'm it peacefully, gonna, like, steal you're that an interventionist or, or authoritarian. All over social media. That is such a great point. Like, uh, <laughs> these are natural human um, actions. And if you do it peacefully, then you are a libertarian. Like, uh, that's a really, really great statement. <laughs> that's it. 
Well, I, 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 I sometimes I come up with these things uh, spontaneously, but the point is, I, I've been reading this stuff for more than fifty years now. Since so actually fifty years ago, I first read Al, um, mm -hmm. Alan Greenspan's uh, Golden Economic Freedom, and I discussed that in my book on the Federal Reserve that just came out uh, as sort of the um, uh, basis for his turning around and becoming the head of the institutions that he. Mm -hmm vociferously criticized in that essay of the Fed giving us the bubble of the 1920s, and then he's in charge of the Fed giving us the bubble of the dot-com bubble and then the uh, housing bubble. It's so ironic that he was a great critic of the Fed when he was a private mm -hmm. citizen, and then he becomes part of the swamp, if you will, in Washington, D.C., as head of the Federal Reserve. Well, no, and so, as they say, you can't make this stuff honestly, up. Honestly, I'm, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. As a former neocon, I've always looked at Greenspan as having really uh, convoluted economic ideas. I did not understand that at one point he was, had a different ideology, which just goes to show that power creates more power and corruption. Yeah. Oh, boy. Let me tell you, yeah, that's about the beltway. It's um, people who go to Washington, they drink the water, and they really become – uh, mm -hmm. a defender of, 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 of the crown, if you will, the crown being uh, the federal government. And um, it's leading us to a very bad place. That's my biggest fear. Uh, hopefully Trump has enough common sense. But he's that not he criticized he, the Iraq he war just, during the uh, campaign. Can I, I'm sorry he to will not because you're so much more brilliant he, than I am. But I'm, I'm going way off script here. But I'm really enjoying this conversation. Uh -huh. And it's my show. Um, so he just vetoed a bill to disarm the Saudis. I'm sure you probably, as a libertarian, understand that the worst thing in the world yeah. that's happening right now is the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. So we are arming the... Oh, no. Yeah, that's and it's now we're on the news. Um, on and the news. that's been one of my biggest... Uh, uh, why I want to get my voice out there on my brace. A lot of money for Save the Children slash Yemen. And... I just can't understand why people don't see this. So he had, as an executive, uh, with unconstitutional authority, because pretty much the president can do what he wants nowadays. Um, the Constitution is just so long gone. Um, but all he would have to say to the Saudis is, and I'm sorry, Murray, because you're a fancy guy, but I, I swear on my show. All he would have to say is, fuck you. You get nothing. But he doesn't do that. Um, because... What happens to the executive once he gets in office, regardless of what Trump said before? He has voices in his ear, and these are the neocons, and these are uh, this. This is swamp, and so yeah, uh, yeah. for him to uh, say we're not going to arm you to the Saudis, or we're not going to back your support, we're not going to refuel your ships or your airplanes, that would go against uh, the status quo, and he won't do that because every president, regardless of how you think that he's different and you think maybe Trump is different. He's not. He bows to the same masters and that it, yeah, it's, it's the state. Well, his first, mm -hmm. yeah, his first trip overseas, I think was to Saudi Arabia. I mean, the, that's a telling um, uh, event that why would he go to Saudi Arabia as, as a, his first uh, overseas trip? Uh, and, as it's you the point worst out, thing that's the happening Yemen crisis in the world is right just now. unbelievable. I mean, Holocaust numbers. I don't think people understand that. So, 250,000 civilian deaths right now. They're literally bombing flocks of sheep to starve these people. I don't think people realize that. When this ends, even if it ends today, uh, the fallout from it will be close to a million. It's a Holocaust. Well, the. You have uh, cholera and typhus and all these horrible diseases going on. That the infrastructure is. is being destroyed. It's one of the uh, poorest places on the planet. I it, mean, it's like it's like we bombing yeah. Haiti. I mean, uh, exactly. what would happen it's if we bombed Haiti? It would be a total mid or, a nightmare. Middle Eastern country out uh, there. So, uh, like they so, don't have many resources. And it, and mm -hmm. it's probably one of the poorest countries in the world, if not the poorest country in the world. There's just nothing there. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it just shows you where the Democrats and the Republicans in Washington heads are at when they're talking about this nonsense of this uh, of Russia gate and Russian meddling. When you have this incredible uh, human disaster that years ago, the Democrats would be jumping up and down. Oh, and they're not. They consider themselves such great humanitarians. Now they don't. Nope. 
There's they probably can't even find like, Yemen on a map, I bet. Maybe. Um, but uh, most Democrats I, are, uh, there's such partisanship in this country, uh, partisan politics, that literally kids are crapping themselves to death across the globe and the U.S. is complicit, and they don't care because the orange man in the office does something bad. Like, what does that say about our country right now? Well, I've been around a long time now. Uh, I've been in America now 70 years next month, and we've seen a devaluation, not only of our money, but our culture, our values. Everything is partisanship in Washington, D.C. Uh, the roads are in terrible shape. Um, uh, you saw mm-hmm. the incident in New York mm-hmm. City where they were throwing water on on the police. Uh, it shows mm-hmm. you a breakdown of, of of just a civil society, um, and uh, where this ends uh, could be either major authoritarian author, authoritarianism, where governments really uh, no, I down, believe that know, is actually and all that. Um, Hopefully, we won't get there. The police state, uh, but. Um, and the worship of the police state and the way that we're policing society and taking like national law and federal law and applying it to localities is a very scary to me. And I. Well, this is what you have. This is what you have when you have this monetary um, uh, instability that causes the economy to go through these cycles. And the question is, when does the mass cycle downturn occur? And I'm looking at several indicators that I looked at. And one of the key indicators that sort of uh, foretells that the economy is mm-hmm. ready to roll over is when the unemployment rate starts creeping up. And uh, if you look at every economic downturn, the unemployment rate starts creeping up. And if it st- should happen next year, that's why Trump wants low interest rates. Well, he's rates. trying to get reelected. That's why he's badgering the Federal yeah. Reserve to keep interest rates low. Yeah, well, that's the whole. This is what Nixon did in seventy one and seventy two when Arthur Burns was at the Fed. So Trump is playing the same game that presidents have always played. Johnson did this in sixty seven uh, when he got the Federal Reserve Chairman down at his Texas ranch and said, "You got to keep interest rates low to fund the uh, Vietnam War and and the Great Society programs." So this is nothing new, but uh, uh, but Trump is playing a very, I think, politically um, a dangerous game by tying. His presidency for mm-hmm. the stock market. Because if the stock market starts tumbling next year or, if not, or this year, who knows? I mean, this October is the 90th anniversary of the uh, stock market crash of 1929. And uh, stranger things have happened that, when you have these let, uh, major anniversaries going on. Um, so, so the uh, stock market, a lot of people tie it to government. And I think that they're actually not associated as well as people think. So how does the government affect the stock market? Well, the government, not so much per se, but it's really the Federal Reserve. Uh, that's, why, that's why my book really points this out very nicely, is the stock market is really dependent upon liquidity. Because okay. what drives prices high? Liquidity. What determines liquidity in the system? The Federal Reserve by its printing of money or the creation of money through the banking system. And I describe that in the book. So it's really a good introduction to people who want a little history about money and banking in the United States, uh, what money ha- should be, has been. And how the Federal Reserve during the Greenspan and Bernanke eras uh, gave us these two bubbles, the dot-com bubble and the housing mm-hmm. bubble, and how the Austrians were right about all this stuff. Uh, now, there were some uh, uh, mainstream yeah. economists that got it right also, but for the wrong reasons, I think. But the Austrians got it right because of the, their focus yeah. on the Federal Reserve and credit and interest rates and all that stuff, which is what the driving force is for the stock market, for the bond market, for the currency markets. And so uh, that's why uh, there are a lot of Fed watchers out there that, that are, who watch what the Federal Reserve policy is. And um, right now, the Federal Reserve is trying to manage the economy, which they can't do successfully over the long term. They can do it over the short term. And Bernanke said in his testimony, which is in the record that I quoted, mm-hmm. the Fe- he said the Federal Reserve manipulates interest rates. Well, I- now, that He's was a shocking it's revelation a that he would say that because, yeah. because corporate, yeah, <clears throat> if, a, if a corporate executive said we manipulate prices of our goods, they would be hauled before Congress and probably be uh, arrested for manipulation. And so this is another example of why the Federal Reserve is, a, uh, is a, uh, an, 
an, an can, antithesis to can I, sustainable can I interject, prosperity. Um, we do have prosperity, but it's not because I, of the Federal Reserve. It's basically sure. a, a not a free market principle. And as an anarchist, anybody that goes against free market economics is yeah. false. And so it's a false market, and that's why it fails. Um, it's a monopoly on force. Uh, yeah. which is not natural and not free market, obviously it's going to fail yeah. and it oppresses people and it doesn't lend people to free market associations. And I don't think a lot of people understand free markets um, because most people are tied to the R&D. And you being a libertarian have a much more um, awakened sense of that and as an economist as well. So I'm going to go on to another question because we're, we've just had a great conversation and we're rounding out into the hour and I haven't even asked like, 10% of the questions I'm going to ask you. I had a lot of uh, uh, messages about <laughs> things to ask you, and so I will. Um, sure. We talked about the history of the Federal Reserves. What would you think would be an alternative to the Fed? Well, basically before the Fed, remember the dollar was defined mm -hmm. in 1792 as one 20th of an ounce of gold. So you could take a $20, um, uh, $20 paper mm -hmm. note and go to the bank and get a $20 gold piece for it. And so w once you have convertibility or backing, remember the dollar sure. is a name of a unit weight of gold, just as the other currencies represented weights of gold or silver or whatever the case may be. Paper money is not money. It's a, paper, it's a money substitute. And that's one, what I point out in the book, how we go from barter to uh, uh gold-backed money to uh, uh, paper money to uh, uh, demand deposits, checking accounts, if you will. That, those all mm -hmm. have to be backed by gold in a free market system. Uh, and Murray Rothbard points this out wonderfully in the mystery, his book, The Mystery of Banking, and his other book, What Has Government mm -hmm. Done to Our Money, which you can all read free on the Mises.org website. These, these are things that I learned uh, 45 years ago which rounded out my education about money, banking, and finance, which allowed me to become a finance professor and uh, write this book on the Fed, because I think every generation sort of needs a primer on how to, how to uh, understand what's going on. So I take the reader through money and banking and uh, what the Federal Reserve has done to give us the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble. So in, in a free market monetary system, You'd have gold coins circulating, and you'd have claims to the gold in reserve. They would be paper money, like we had, uh, uh, mm -hmm. where the note would say "payable and lawful money." That's what it said on the on the notes that that way you can get take that paper money and get gold for it, a twenty dollar gold piece or, or a ten dollar gold piece or a five dollar gold piece, double eagle, eagle, and, and half eagle. That's the way a free market money system works. That's the way money works without. Uh, uh, a f central bank. That's what that's what freedom is all about. That's what monetary freedom is all about. Not the system that we have today, which is basically for the, for the bankers and for Wall Street to prop so, up Murray, um, you've all been the a financial great, assets um, that are out there. Source of information, and we have not even gone anywhere close to my uh, notes. But I kind of like that because um, I really appreciate your point of view, your perspective, um, and you rub shoulders with Rothbard, Rothbard which is super cool. I'm kind of jealous of that. Mm -hmm. Wait, he was okay. just an incredible human before being. I mean, we, before we, before I go on to my last question, tell me, was, about uh, was, tell me about Henry Rothbard. Tell me about him as a human being. Sure. Well, I wasn't that close to him. I mean, he lived in uh, right. New York City when I lived in New York City. Then I moved to New Jersey. And then he got uh, an appointment that he should have gotten in New York City. Uh, he got an endowed chair at the mm -hmm. UNLV in Las Vegas, University of Nevada at Las Vegas. And uh, he had a great career there, wrote a lot of books and uh, articles to, to say. And he was just incredibly <laughs> optimistic. I mean, his knowledge of any, any subject was just unbelievable. And he, he was just always had a smile on his face. He would, I, didn't, I never saw him uh, uh, downbeat at conferences. And uh, he just was a great raconteur, storyteller. And, um, but what impressed me so much about him is that he just knew so much about everything. I mean, it's just, he was a walking encyclopedia, which uh, in his apartment in New York City was lined with probably 10,000 books. I mean, everywhere you went, there were bookshelves and uh, uh, he just read everything. And uh, he made a living by doing book reviews in the 1950s before he got a, a teaching position. So he's probably the most well-read individual I ever met. 
Plus, he was incredibly productive. I mean, he would type. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he could write a book in a week. That's uh, that's how productive he was. I mean, I mean, it, it was just incredible. I mean, um, uh, he wrote something for me uh, back in the 1970s at a conference that I helped organize about inflation in the 1970s. And he wrote an essay that was, I think, 20, 30 pages long. And I don't know, in a day or two. So um, with footnotes and everything. So he was just a prolific individual, a, a, a wonderful human being. And it's unfortunate that um, he passed away at such an early age, uh, 1995, when he could have had uh, at least two more decades of uh, productivity. And who knows what uh, he, his influence would have been. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's great today because of the Mises.org website. Uh, all his work is available through there uh, for free which is why the internet is such I an agree. incredible tool for liberating the human mind so they can read material that otherwise uh, w was not available. If I you look at it. the back, here's my, Marie, all my it. books back here. I must have about a thousand, I must have a thousand books I picked up over the years. And uh, this is what academics do is they read so they can make cogent, coherent um, uh, presentations about different topics. And, um, in the fall, um, I expect to make a presentation at the college for a memorial lecture for one of our colleagues who hired me back in 1985 on America, the next 70 years, since it's the 70th anniversary of coming to America, go over the past 70 years and talk about what America could be like mm. over the next 70 years. So I'm looking forward to making that presentation. Then, of course, going out yeah. and talking about the Fed and having honest money, having money that reflects the uh, the um, ability of people to trade and not have their currency uh, devalued and not have these cycles anymore uh, because that's what's debilitating. Oh, I mean, there for are sure. People still haven't yeah. recovered from the 2008 Great Recession. There are still communities that have been devastated um, as, uh, as jobs have gone overseas and factories have closed. So if we had a sounder economy, I think we'd have a lot more manufacturing in the United States, which would be great because those are pretty decent paying jobs. Instead, um, our monetary policy, as I pointed out earlier, yeah, have helped sure. drive uh, businesses overseas because of uh, higher costs here. So they go to the low cost producers overseas well, I, and uh, I would in South that America and Mexico Americans, and other places like that. Uh, because they choose the R or the D, they don't understand free market economics. Um, and so I'm really great, uh, grateful for your book. We have gone long, but it's been really, really fun. And you're well, thank you. You're a treasure. I'm, I'm actually really, I feel very um, grateful to have interviewed you because I think you're just a wonderful economist in our age. And um, there's a lack of economic understanding in this generation. And I'm a newer libertarian. I've only been an anarchist as, as of the last couple of years and then a big L libertarian before that. So um, I'm a big fan of Austrian economics having been a former uh, neocon. Um, so I'm going to ask you just a couple quick fire questions because we have to round out for the video. Um, sure. We did that. We did that. Your book, so, which has a really cool title. Plug your book. <laughs> I like it. Well, Why the Federal Reserve Sucks. Um, I could have said Why no, the Federal, why the Federal no, Reserve sucks. is uh, counterproductive, which yeah. would have been nice. Uh, it really does. I mean, when, all it means is it's a colloquial term saying it's bad. Uh, that, that's, and so uh, someone from uh, a, a digital marketing person a couple of years ago when I was uh, finishing writing the book said, you need an edgy title. So uh, we came up with this edgy title because, uh, you need, as they say, the squeaky uh, wheel uh, uh, gets, gets noticed. And so hopefully people will not be turned off in, in the uh, mainstream mm -hmm. media. But this is why social media is so important. That's why if this book becomes uh, uh, well-established, not only through the libertarian community, uh, the Austrian economic community, but uh, mainstream uh, people who want a primer. That's I mean, important. this book is easy to read. Yeah, it really is. Important. I wrote it specifically so you, don't, so, you, so you don't need a technical background in money and banking. Uh, and I think um, uh, since my wife, uh, who read the, the, uh, the book uh, when we were going through the proofs, uh, she caught a few uh, changes that we made, and I, and she liked it. And she's not an uh, an economics person. She was a bio teacher and a, and a uh, 
uh, an administrator in the New York City school system. And she said she really liked it because it explains things very easily for the average person. So I'm hoping that people buy a copy, buy one for their neighbor, their friend, their best for, uh, uh, colleague. And, it, and we get a snowball effect. And this is how books get noticed by the media when it goes higher on the Amazon rankings. And if lightning should strike and uh, it goes on um, uh, the New York Times bestseller list, yeah. and I can get on some of the major cable shows, that would be the key, whether it's on Fox or CN MSNBC or CNN, and just challenge, have a discussion, have a civil discussion without any name calling or finger pointing saying, listen, here's mm -hmm. what the Fed has done, and here's how it does it. And why should we try something different? Because if we try something different, maybe we would have better outcomes I, instead of this roller coaster. I think that you economy. spoke that more eloquently than I could ever. So I will end our chat because Facebook <laughs> has a certain algorithm. So I'm going to end at about an uh, hour 20. Um, what I would say is to follow Maurice, Maurice Sabrin, um, I'm going to link the show notes when we go off on We Are Libertarians. As I said in the beginning, Ginger Arkey is on We Are Libertarians. It's a wonderful network. Obviously, you can still follow me here on just my social media, um, but I will link his, uh, the show notes and his book about why the Fed sucks, which it totally sucks ass. Um, and then I'll link some of his social media pages, but um, I really, I have really had a great discussion with you, Marie, and I really appreciate you. Um, and so... I hope your new venture into speaking to people and kind of reviving that whole 2008, 2012 campaign about why the Fed sucks, which has been lost amongst most people. I hope you can bring that back. I, I'm very excited about that. You're brilliant. And <clears throat> to report a problem. Hi. Um, so we'll, edit that out but anyways <laughs> um i appreciate <laughs> that's the part of my uh mm -hmm. show notes but i really appreciate you and so go ahead and link what you want people to go to well if you go to my blog murraysabrin.com you can see the front mm. cover the back cover which has a wonderful endorsement by ron paul and then the link to the amazon where you can purchase the book and uh i really hope that uh, not for me personally because uh uh, this book is really was a labor of love. I wrote it on sabbatical two years ago, and uh, the Isn't college that old? Uh, gave me the opportunity to write this book. And so, uh, well, it was written specifically as okay. a financial history of the dot com and housing bubble, and what the Fed was doing or not doing and saying at, at the time. So the the goal was to point out who was right and who was wrong, and uh, there are a lot of mm -hmm. people who were wrong about what was going on during both bubbles because they don't focus on the key component mm -hmm. of bubbles, which is money printing by the Federal Reserve. And so I point this out. And then there's a postscript, which I wrote earlier this year, about uh, Chairman Powell, whether he's going to cave guy, into Donald whatever Trump's about that guy. Uh, call for lower interest <laughs> rates. And next week we will sit. Well, here's the point. Uh, Everyone thinks that the Federal Reserve is going to lower interest rates, which would be sure. unprecedented. Yeah. That they lower interest rates with the stock market at an all-time high and unemployment at, at, at one of the lowest levels in uh, history. <laughs> this would be unprecedented, which, would, which from, from my perspective, I think the Fed is not going to uh, lower rates because everyone's expecting it. And if they do lower rates, then the notion that the Fed is independent, which is what uh, Chairman Powell says constantly, we are independent – if they lower rates, then it would be it would uh, deny the notion that they're independent because mm -hmm. they're basically doing what Trump wants them to do. So the Fed is between the rock and a hard place. And so I think if they want to exert their ind independence, they won't raise they won't lower rates. They'll keep rates at, at the same level and say, we're just going to wait and see exactly but how the economy how do we unfolds abolish them? before we do anything. So. Uh, I, well, this is why. It's going to take a lot of education and grassroots efforts like you're doing with the podcast. You know, if we could reach several million people with the, with the concept that the Fed is not our friend, the, fr the Fed does not give us good outcomes. It gives us these bubbles. And it's great when the bubbles are uh, expanding because people's incomes go up, their, uh, their uh, asset values go up. Uh, especially housing and artwork and things like that. But most people don't own these very expensive mm -hmm. items. Most people in America have very little assets. In fact, 
what, what, there's, a, there's a statistic out there that uh, a substantial number of Americans don't have $400 for an emergency repair for their car. I mean, people are really hurting out there. But if you live in New York City, a metropolitan area like I do in uh, New Jersey or in San Francisco or Boston, the metropolitan areas where there's a lot of wealth concentrated. But if you live in rural and uh, uh, a flyover country, uh, people are just scraping by from mm -hmm. day to day, week to week, month to month. So they don't have much assets. They don't have much income. Uh, and so, as I've been saying for decades, what we need to do is develop a culture of financial independence. And the, with the federal government spending $4.4 trillion and mm -hmm. states spending another trillion plus dollars uh, or more, the government is really setting up resources that can be better used by people mm -hmm and in their communities to develop the institutions and the organizations from a free market, nonprofit perspective that would give us better outcomes in terms of jobs and healthcare. That's basic, and education. That's really the, the theme of my writing going forward, which I'll have a lot to do because I'll be, th my, this coming year is my last mm -hmm. year as a, as a professor. After 35 years, I think it's time to um, hang up the uh, shingle, so to speak, and um, go out there and try to do as much as I can to educate people outside the classroom and um, have a, more, a greater presence on social media and just go out there and speak to people all over the country if possible and point out that um, uh, all is not right with America and here are the reasons why and we need free markets mm -hmm. because free markets are an extension yeah. of ourselves and that's what I think we have to tie in. Free markets are what people are all about. Just as our arms and legs are part of us, free markets are part of the, our social um, uh, structure I, I that would makes quite agree. life and worth living. I've so much, even though we had a glitch earlier, it's fine because we do this live and most people aren't brave enough to do what I do live. But um, uh, we had a great discussion about like market principles and economics and some people might find that boring, but actually I think this is a really interesting discussion. And so I really appreciate you coming on and explaining things in layman's terms. That's really important. Um, so I would encourage you to go to Murray's uh, Facebook site or his uh, website. Can you drop those credentials right now? Uh, the website is murraysaver.com. Uh, yes. And guess um, what? Here's uh, a copy of the book. Uh, and you can see this on, on uh, my website. Um, the front and back cover, here's the back cover with Ron Paul's endorsement. Of course, you can, it's small print that can bring it closer and um, a little bio about me. But if you go to my website, we have all the good stuff. Uh, I don't do a lot of original writing now because I'm working on this other book on healthcare. but I'm posting articles that I think are important that people should read so they could just find um, two, three articles a day that I think mm -hmm. explain what's going on overseas, what's going on domestically. And this way, people get an idea that um, there's a better way of doing things. I, I like to put things in positive terms. Wh how can we have better outcomes for the economy, for healthcare, for international relations, as opposed to just uh, bashing people and, um, and who they are? I just want to talk about how we can achieve a, a better society. How we can, yeah. That's what libertarianism is all about, is how to achieve a better society with, le with no wars, with uh, I, no I strike, think that's social strike, a with um, position. Um, so many people fight against what's happening now, and they don't provide any resource as to how it can be better. And I think you're doing that with your book. Um, we can just be better, people. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> well, there's I am a, great, a part of it. There's a actually. great organization called We Do yeah. Better, and they're uh, proposing. Yeah, that, that to me, that, that's what I would propose in my um, in my book on healthcare. Mm -hmm is that uh, if we have universal tax credits, that will help fund the nonprofit. That's what we to do. provide health care. I'm a member, I donate, folks. and I'm and we can, probably going to do some media for that. And, that's, and that's what you do. Do stuff on any level you can. It, like, uh, don't be an asshole that sits and criticizes things. Like, maybe do something. <laughs> well, well, that's it. I was invited by the founder of a nonprofit health center in Bergen County. Uh, 15 years ago, and uh, this fall they're having their 10th anniversary. Uh, it took five years to get the place going, but they they do a great job in saving lives in Bergen County, which is a fairly wealthy community. But uh, there are people who are still um, uh, 
don't have much means. And so uh, we have a great nonprofit right here in Hackensack, uh, the county seat, and they do a great job in saving people's lives and getting them mm -hmm. back to better health. So it's a matter of personal responsibility. It's community responsibility. It's the institutions mm -hmm. we need have to be at the local level as opposed to top down, the trickle down, I call it the trickle down economics from Washington, the Medicare, the, the Medicaid, the Social Security, all these programs out of Washington, the Department we need of Education, to Department of Energy. We don't need these institutions, organizations. Every, absolutely. It, it's about individuals, family, community. That is what the structure of a free society, of a prosperous yeah. society would be all uh, about instead of that, this welfare warfare state that we have. All right, thank you so much for coming on, Marie. You're, you're a source of great wisdom and information. I, I've enjoyed it. And um, uh, maybe I have some, I have a broad spectrum of listeners. So I would say to you all what I say at the close of everything, but uh, maybe Murray is a little bit more of a minarchist than I am, but he's a brilliant man and he has a lot of things to say that could probably lead to more, uh, more for free society than us sitting around and, and bitching who's a minarchist and who's an anarchist. Um, and so I'm pragmatic in that idea. So I'm going to close this show saying thank you so much, Murray. I've really enjoyed it. And what I always say, grace and peace to you, my lovelies, and fuck the state.